Okay, I want to thank David Kennedy and the Growing and Understanding Group for inviting me back because more has been revealed since the last time we talked. Uh, just two months ago, I did a presentation for you folks called More Has Been Revealed. Uh, and uh, I wanted to add some recently discovered facts to those that were already reported in my book. And certainly I wanted to correct some mistakes that were made in my book. And as always, I have personal opinions that I love to uh, share with people. Uh, but in the short time since then, uh, even more has been revealed. And, and for this, I really have to graciously thank a, a host of, of very, very careful readers, along with those AA historians who are exploring a wealth of primary documents to be found in our archive. People are continuing to dig in there and find wonderful, wonderful stuff that hasn't come to the surface before. So in the interest of, of keeping our history of the flying blind period current, that's really the, 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 the area of my focus is from the time Bill Wilson got sober in December of 1934 until the book was published in April 10th of 1939, which Bill called the flying blind period. And in correcting some errors made in my presentations, uh, I'd like to report some new information, note some newly discovered mistakes and offer some further opinions. Uh, first of all, more has been revealed from Q&A questions. So uh, when we do different things, uh, do presentations or these, uh, these sessions where people are reading from my book, I do a Q&A session after those presentations, and, and they're always fascinating. And with some regularity, I learn something new. Um, and, and that was the case when somebody asked me in one of the Q&A sessions uh, a, a few weeks ago. They said, so they, they had a question about Evie's second visit to Bill while he was in Towns Hospital in December of 1934. And I was like, there was a, there was a second visit? from Evie to Bill before he went into the hospital. I mean, everybody knows about the kitchen table story, but there was another visit from him. And that was news to me. Um, it was pointed out to me that Bill had given some details about this second visit in a 1954 recording he did, which was published in a book called My First 40 Years. And this is what he had to say about the second visit. He said, one afternoon, Evie turned up with a friend, Shep Cornell. He'd been a drinker too. Now near the top echelon of the Oxford groups, he didn't seem to be much like Ebby at all. When he told me about his drinking, I thought he was a sissy. Just an episode boy, hadn't really suffered much. He soon let me see that he was a socialite, and I didn't like socialites. He gave me the Oxford group's boast aggressively, and with all the punch he could pack, I didn't like this at all. When they were gone, I took to the bottle, and I really punished it. So this is this is Bill's 1954 recollection of something that happened in 1934, uh, and I, I was I was worried. I'm not worried, but I was I was um, I was not happy with the fact that Bill didn't give much detail about what this Oxford Group boast aggressively delivered was all about. Uh, now Ernie Kurtz in his book Not God, he also has a paragraph on this second meeting, and and he he references Robert Thompson's book Bill W, a biography of Bill Wilson, as his source. Um, I've got two different ones there because uh, Ernie quotes page two ten to two eleven, but in my book it's on page one ninety one, so I presume there are different editions of the book uh, to explain that. Thompson's book was published in nineteen seventy five, four years after Bill died, uh, and he claims it was based on. Quote, my privilege of having known and worked besides Bill during the last 12 years of his life. In most cases, what, what does this mean? In most cases, that means that he's standing by while Bill Wilson is relating all those often told and hollowed stories for which he was so famous. Many of which, if you've read my book, you know, weren't absolutely historically accurate. However, this story by Thompson, his more detailed version of this second visit, did likely come directly from Bill Wilson. I mean, it's just rife with all kinds of details. There would be absolutely no reason for him to make up all these, these wonderful details. And here's what, here's what Thompson writes in his book, quoting Bill Wilson. His resentment, Bill's resentment, mounted and seemed to come to a peak when Abby phoned again a few days later and said he would like to stop by with a friend from his group. So Bill was unhappy about the fact that Evie was sober and he just kept drinking and couldn't seem to stop. He had this resentment, resentment going, but Evie's going to come back and visit him again. And he said the, the man he chose to bring along with him was Shep Cornell, and this was a mistake. Cornell was a handsome, well-built and well-born, a, a young fellow whom Bill immediately pegged as a socialite. He was cheery and outgoing and, and ready to confess to having had quite a drinking career himself. 
Uh, but about this, Bill had his, his doubts, serious doubts. As a drunk, he was sure Connell was a panty waste, a man who'd probably gone wild one night or on too many sherries at a junior league cotillion. But, but God knew he was sober now, and God knew they both seemed to be enjoying their sobriety. They talked incessantly, Bill says, discussing and discussed the serenity of their new life and their newfound sense of purpose. They touched on the power of prayer and the rewards of meditation. So this is the this is the Oxford group boast that Bill's getting. And but most of all, the conversation that afternoon had to do with love, a new kind of love, loving, a complete giving of oneself that had no price tag on it. Thank you, Robert Thompson, for this much more detailed version. This and by the way, this is to my mind, this is just an excellent, excellent example of the interesting question of how do we, how do, how do you weigh evidence? I mean, some evidence is really questionable and some evidence is rock solid. And so you get this new story about this second visit and I've got these two different sources and I'm on the line. So, so how, how true is that? Is that what really happened? Is that what really happened? Uh, but, and you really have to pay attention to the fact that so many of these long told after the fact stories, most especially Bill Wilson's long told after the fact stories, they're just contaminated by faulty memories, and most especially, they're, they're contaminated by the need to make the stories of the past fit into the present reality. So things get changed from the past so that they just, yeah, that's how we got it done, right there, early in the beginning. But although this story doesn't surface until 20 years after the fact, it does, for me at least, it has a real ring of authenticity. I really... I don't have a real problem with this story, uh, mainly because it isn't a it's a new story. You know, it's not one of those old stories that, that that Bill's been repeating ad nauseum for decades now. All of a sudden, bang, it just pops up in the mid 1950s. Uh, now, I was I was speaking with my my friend, Jay Stinnett, who's my go to guy for Oxford Group history, especially. And uh, I was talking to him about this second visit that 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 Ebby and Shep Cornell made. And he told me that Ebby had brought Shep Cornell along that day because after Sam Shoemaker, Shep was the most successful closer that the Oxford group had in New York City. So Ebby comes by and does a does a casual run through with Bill. But here he's bringing back a little bringing back some some power with him the second time around during his first visit. Ebby's approach had been very conversational, just sitting down with an old friend talking to him, blah, blah, blah. But Shep was a very aggressive in putting forth the Oxford Group case. He was really, really pushing it. He was looking for a surrender. He wanted Bill to do one of those get on your knees and surrender to Jesus kind of things. Uh, but this was not working for Bill Wilson. He, he, he really had a negative reaction to, uh, to uh, Shep and his pitch. Uh, Bill clearly, clearly, this is just a great example of the fact that he was going to need a white light experience if he was ever going to be able to overcome his longstanding religious prejudices. He just wasn't dealing with this standardized kind of religious pitch that he was hearing out of uh, Shep Cornell. In my book, I noted that other than Bill and Ebby's very different versions of the kitchen table meeting, uh, which Bill said took place near the end of November, the only other contemporary reference to that particular, that kitchen table meeting, uh, is a July 1935 letter, which was seven or eight months after the fact, uh, from Lois to three of her friends. She, they, they wrote these round robin letters that went around and keeping all her old friends in, 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 in tune or, and uh, in, in up to date on what's going on with them. And in that letter, in that letter of July of 1935, several months after this fact happened, she says to her friends, Bill has stopped drinking through the Oxford group. Wow, okay, Bill has stopped drinking through the Oxford group. And she claims that this came about because last December, not November, last December, Abby Thatcher appeared sober for the first time in years and with a very strange story to tell about a religion called the Oxford group, which had cured him just as he was about to be committed to an insane asylum. Well, that fits all all the known facts and corroborated facts we have about that, but except for this December thing. And in my book, I said that Lois's December notation contradicts Bill's story. And, and I said that it adds yet another layer of confusion to the story. I couldn't figure out how to, how to adjudicate the two of those things together. They were, they were clearly contradictory. But, you know, it may have been a fact that both of them were right. Isn't it possible that maybe both of them were right? And maybe that's the way we can we can collaborate and adjudicate these two different contradictory stories. Maybe Bill was talking about the very first meeting with Abby, the one that happened near the end of November, while Lois was making reference to the second visit from Abby and Shep. 
which happened in December. That would make perfect sense out of those two accounts. So uh, that's uh, that's the Ebby Shep second visit revelation for me. Uh, also, more has been revealed from new sources. Uh, just a few days after my last presentation, that more has been revealed presentation I did for you guys, uh, fellow A historian Jim Worley of Cancun emailed wondering if I had if I'd ever seen a letter that he had just found online in the in the Brown University archives. No, Jim, I had not. I mean, I've been to Brown University a number of times, and I've, I thought I had looked at everything they had there, <clears throat> but I had never seen this letter, or I saw it so long ago when I didn't realize the significance of it, perhaps. Uh, and it's, this was just a, just a great, great, great letter. Thank you very much, Jim. So it's a, a letter is dated March 11th, 1939. So this is almost a, a, a month to the day before the big book comes out. And it's from uh, a reverend, D.E. Nickerson, and he, he's called, he's writing in from Oarsville, Oarsville, Ohio, which is a little over 30 miles southwest of Akron. Uh, and he sent Dr. Bob a story that he has ghostwritten. Nickerson has ghostwritten a story for a guy named Harry Zellers, who's a local barber down in Oarsville, Ohio. Uh, and this is what the letter looks like. It's a beautiful thing. It is just great to be able to go online and pull these things out and for people to go find things that I didn't see when I was there at Brown University. Um, so Nickerson writes to Dr. Bobby, says, uh, quote, I'm, I'm terribly sorry that it has been necessary to delay the enclosed manuscript. Obviously, he, he was supposed to get it to Bob sooner concerning some of the facts in Zoller's life, but it just it just couldn't be helped. Uh, he and I were not able to get together the day I thought we would. And, and, and then, too, I had a certain amount of detail work that just had to be done. I, I sat down at my typewriter just after dinner and hurriedly jotted down some of the facts that Zoller had given me. I'm sending you this rambling collection of hurried thoughts, hoping that you will see fit to cut and slash it. Also, doctor it in any way you care to. You saw Zolders in his nervous state, and it would be a fine thing if you could or would add a paragraph. You know the necessary phraseology that I do not. So Dickerson sending off this story, but he's telling Bob, have at it. You can edit this any way you want. This is your base document. Do with it what you will. Unfortunately, the, a closed manuscript, the original version of Zoller's story, was not saved, so we have no idea how much editing, if any, if any, was done to the story. Harry's story mentions a deacon and a pastor, Nickerson would be the pastor, who helped him, quote, have a vital spiritual experience. That's about all he talks about in, 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 in like, what happened? You know, I was drinking one day, and the next day I wasn't drinking, what happened? Well, I had a vital spiritual experience. And he says that together... Those three guys have helped nine other local men find a way out of the difficulties which were identical with mine. Nickerson's letter also at the very bottom tells Dr. Bob that he can be expecting all 12 of them, all 12 of these sober guys from, from Orville to show up at the next Wednesday night meeting in Akron, which is just a wonderful little tidbit that I, I mean, I just didn't think about how many people were coming in from outside. People are coming down from Cleveland, of course, but, but nobody ever mentions there were people coming in from Orville, which are almost exactly the same distance away from Akron as, as uh, Cleveland is. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Zoller's quit drinking in March of 1937, so he was a full two years sober when the story was written for him. Uh, the story but the story didn't arrive in time to be included in the multilith printing, which was printed uh, February 22nd or 24th of 1939. But it did appear in the first edition of the big book under the title A Close Shave. Little little play there on the fact that it was written by a barber. <clears throat> and it's the shortest story. It's just 588 words from an Ohio alcoholic to appear in the original big book. So I would suspect there wasn't a lot of editing done to it. They didn't add a lot of details to whatever Nickerson had sent them. So if you've read my book, you know that Jim Scott was, was ghostwriting stories all the time out in Ohio. But it turns out he wasn't the only person in Ohio that was ghostwriting stories for the big book. At least one other person was taking talking to sober men in Ohio and writing stories for them to be submitted to New York for the big book. Great find, Jim. Thank you for sharing. I just love getting that. And I love, love, you know, just putting it all together and 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 adding one more bit of information uh, to our picture of what was actually going out going on in Akron, Ohio in early 1939. Also, um, more was revealed about my mistakes. <clears throat> my AA friend John Barton, uh, an AA historian uh, from New Jersey, 
uh, asked me what evidence I had that Hank Parker uh, was drinking in August of 1939. John was questioning this August date that I that I was that I was talking about. And although that particular claim doesn't appear in my book, it was something that I've repeated every time I did my presentation on Hank Parker's the co-founder who drank. Um, it was just I, I, so I, I so I send John the evidence. I got this evidence, right? I sent him the evidence that I had for this August slip. And uh, and uh, it was displayed on three PowerPoint slides near the end of that presentation that I did on Hank Parker's that I've been doing over uh, and over for the last couple of years. And my evidence, the evidence that I had on those three slides was, was based on several quotes I found in Lois's 1939 diary. Uh, Lois, Lois's diary entries for 37 and 38 can be really, really sparse or non-existent. But once, once uh, uh, the month after after the big book came out, they were they were they lost their house in Brooklyn, and they were they're basically on the road. And all of a sudden, Lois is writing all kinds of stuff in in the in the 1939 diary um, in May, June, July, and uh, so there's a lot of really great information in her diary and for the 1939 year. So here's what she says: uh, August 15th, August, John, it's August. Hank didn't go to a meeting, and then August 16th. Henry was drinking and drove Bill home from the station and then went back to town for more. So I couldn't believe Bill Wilson got in the car with the drunk guy, but uh, but he did. And the guy went back for drinking more. And then on August 19th, we've got three August dates here. Henry is trying to shake out of it. He's having a hard time. He's drinking. September, September 5th, 1939, Kathleen, that's Hank's wife, Kathleen, phoned to say that she thought Hank was drunk. Whoa. September 6th, Hank drunk phoned Bill in the afternoon. So Hank Parker's calling Bill drunk. And after a lot of phoning, Bill found him and brought him back to McDougal's and put him to bed. September 7th, 1939, Hank's still pretty drunk. This this first couple of weeks of September are really tough for Hank Parker's. And on September 8th, though, oh, bingo, he gets sober. And the next day on September 10th, Hank arrived sober but jittery. He's having a hard time. So John had some problems with this evidence. Uh, that Hank's drinking began in mid-August, as I had mentioned on the first slide. He was he was questioning that, but he was okay with the September thing. But how did how do I know that that Hank Parker's was drinking in in August? Uh, and he pointed out that in some entries, Lois wrote about Hank, and in others she wrote about Henry. Oh, I had never noticed that before. It was right there in bold face in front of me every time I did this presentation, but I had never noticed that before. Now. John said that while Bill often referred to Hank Parkhurst as Henry, as, as he does almost completely throughout Alcoholics Anonymous Comes of Age, Lois always called him Hank in her diary. And, and he told me that this Henry in Lois's diary wasn't Hank Parkhurst. It was a new recruit called Henry Heller, who had first gotten sober in March of 1939. I mean, just a few months before this August slip of his. Uh, John's argument was really persuasive. I mean, he we we talked about it, and and, and I mean, I couldn't see any way out of uh, the error that he was pointing out to me. And uh, so when I did my doubt my uh, Hank Parker's presentation uh, in Dallas just last month, I was in Dallas doing this presentation. I deleted those two mentions of Henry from the PowerPoint. So now that PowerPoint looked like this. All that was left was. Uh, August 15th, I really love this quote about mid, you know, August 15th, Hank didn't go to a meeting. I mean, that's just, that's, as we, as so many of us know, that's, that's just a common prelude to a slip. No, guy, guy skipping a meeting. So here he is, August 5th, skipping a meeting. Um, um, so, but while preparing for this particular presentation, I thought it might be helpful to see if there was any other information in her diary explaining why Hank had not come to that meeting. So I went back and looked at her diary entries and yikes. The diary entry didn't say Hank didn't go to a meeting. Lois had written Henry didn't go to a meeting. So all three of those August references weren't to Hank Parker's. They were referenced to a guy named Henry Heller. In short, uh, those references were not that I'm drinking again. They're all to Henry Heller. And uh, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa, just making mistakes uh, and things that are just right in front of my face until they're pointed out to me by somebody else. Um, this is just a, an outstanding example of, uh, of of people in our fellowship of historians, a historians keeping each other uh, on the straight and narrow.
Uh, unfortunately, the Hank Parker's presentation on YouTube, I've got that YouTube channel with uh, 10 or 11 presentations up there at the moment, will continue to show that bad information. Uh, and I can only hope that A's truth seekers will also find this later presentation with a correction. Oh, the lesson, the lesson here, the lesson here for me is that, and hopefully for you also, is that accurate history, especially accurate AA history, just like our sobriety, is a group project. It's a group project, people. This isn't, I mean, I'm 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 not not the guy who's got all the answers. We have the answers. And I want to thank John B for uh for pointing out that mistake to me. And 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 we're getting closer to what really happened. And we're not telling bad stories. Thank you, John. More was revealed as I thought about it. <clears throat> Maybe this was a little bit of a light bulb moment, but certainly it felt like that at the time. I, I want to talk some more about William James and the varieties of religious experience. I mean, I, I did that in, in, in the last presentation and in the presentation before. So we're just beating William James's a variety of religious experience to death here. But this book has become such a constant touchstone in Alcoholics Anonymous. But the stories that surround it are seldom supported by any kind of credible facts. Now, in my recent presentation, two presentations ago, Bill's vision and the ever-changing plans, I seriously questioned the idea that Bill Wilson had actually read the varieties of religious experience during his final visit to Towns Hospital. I was just like, there's absolutely no way this guy just completely out of it, just coming off a, a, a Belladonna treatment and a white light experience is going to sit down and just read William James's variety of experience and understand it. Uh, but that story about Bill reading it and understanding it is largely based on this 1954 recording. Again, it's it, it can be found in my first 40 years, where he says that Ebby gave him the varieties of religious experience the day after he had his white light experience. After he had his white light experience. Now, again, remember, Bill was really having pushback on Shep Cornell. And, and I said at that time, he really needed a white light experience to get over his religious prejudices. So, so Ebby shows up with this book the day after Bill's had his white light experience, and he tells Bill, quote, he hadn't, this is what Bill said, quote, he hadn't read much of it himself, but, but said that some of his Oxford group friends thought it was a fine explanation of religious conversion. So Ebby wants to underline for him that this is, this is, a, this is a book that, that talks about religious conversion. Uh, and in that same 1954 talk, Wilson claimed that the moment, quote, the moment Ebby left, I picked up the book and commenced to read it. It was not easy reading, but I kept at it all day. And by nightfall, William James had become a founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I have real trouble with these old years after the fact stories, and most especially this one, and which sets up the false belief that Wilson left the hospital with a burning conviction that alcoholics could simply choose their own conception of God, something I do not believe was true and something which I talked about in that Bill's vision and his ever-changing plans in some detail. Now, again, I get, I'm getting challenged on this. Uh, I get really challenged uh, that Ebby, you know, when I say he never read the thing in, in uh, Towns Hospital, uh, because it, when I read what Bill's version is, it, it, he implies, he doesn't say he read the whole book, it's 597 pages, but he implies that he read the whole thing in one day. And and my friend Jay was, uh, Jay Stinnett, again, he's my he's my Oxford group guy, uh, and he's on top of that kind of stuff. And he's like, well, okay, okay, we'll grant the fact that Bill Wilson did not read Varieties of Religious Experience laying in bed at Towns Hospital. But, uh, <clears throat> uh, but in my next presentation, Based on the, on the on on the input I got from Jay, I allowed us how Bill might have read the conversion chapter, which is chapter nine in the book while at Towns Hospital. Jay said, "I think that Ebby showed up with a bookmark right at chapter chapter nine on this conversion because, as as he said before, Bill said that Ebby said that he was bringing the book because his Oxford group people thought it was a great presentation of religious conversion." So Jay's point is. That's what Ebby was pointing him towards, this one chapter on conversion in the book. And, and again, he said Ebby had told him that the book could provide a fine explanation of religious conversion. And, and, and if Bill's befogged mind couldn't handle processing all 28 pages of that particular chapter, and if you think that might not be true, I suggest that you pull out the varieties of religious experience and try and read that chapter. Uh, he was most likely directed, 
I, when, I, when I said that to Jay, Jay said, well, he was most likely directed to read the story in the middle of that chapter of one Druck's white light experience, which, which, was, which was so similar to his own experience. So here's Abby doing everything he can to get Bill on the Oxford Group train because it's leaving the station. He's going to be leaving Towns Hospital soon. He wants him to stay sober and he wants him to stay sober through the Oxford Group. So that's what he's pushing at Bill. And he doesn't want Bill to think, as he supposedly said to Dr. Dr. Silkworth, that, that you know, he, he fears for his own sanity. And, and, and Silkworth comforts him by saying, look, I don't know what you got, but it's working for you. You should stick with it. But Abby's, Abby's saying, I know what you got. You got one of these conversions here, friend, and you want to hang on to that conversion because it's a real deal. It didn't just happen to you. It's happened to other people. <clears throat> now, all of that, all of that is just kind of, along with the fact that I am a huge fan of William James, is kind of a way of backstory for what I want to say now about that particular uh, thing about Bill Wilson reading Varieties of Religious Experience. Now, I personally have read Varieties twice in the last 30 years or so, but the last time was at least 20 years ago, and I recently decided I want to read it once more. So I'm going to read that book again. Okay. And I, when I made plans to do that, it suddenly struck me that the title of the book is The Varieties of Religious Experiences. This is my little light bulb moment going on here. It is not the varieties of religious beliefs. It's a variety of religious experiences, not the varieties of religious beliefs. Now, James was really clear that he was primarily interested in direct religious experiences, direct religious experiences, rather than any religious dogmas or beliefs or institutional structures. And his investigations of these direct religious experiences, in, he explicitly included such atheistic religions as Buddhism and Emerson's transcendentalism. So he had this hugely wide umbrella under which he just, just collected almost everything that fit his model for a religious, exper uh, for a, uh, religious experience. And, uh, and that included atheistic religions like Buddhism and Emerson's transcendentalism. As he clearly stated in uh, Variety's second lecture, the circumspection of the topic, he's going to, going to tell you what he's going to tell you. Um, quote, now in these lectures, I propose to ignore the institutional branch entirely, to say nothing of the ecclesiastical organization, and to consider as little as possible the systematic theology and the ideas about the gods themselves, and to confine myself as far as I can to personal religion, pure and simple. One man's experience, personal, religion, pure and simple. James' entire book is about raw, individual religious experiences, and he makes no judgments whatsoever on the acceptability or unacceptability of any particular religious beliefs. Please remember that Carl Jung also claimed that a vital religious experience, that's what Bill Wilson typed the first time he typed, there is a solution that... Carl Jung said, you need a vital religious experience. Now, this was later changed before the book got published to a vital spiritual experience. But you needed a vital experience, and that's the only hope you're going to get if you're a real alcoholic. You've got to get one of those experiences. And yet, beliefs rather than experience are exactly what we get as soon as Bill Wilson introduces the varieties of religious experience to the reader. At the end of There is a Solution. Ah. Here's what he says, quote, the distinguished American psychologist, William James, in his book, Varieties of Religious Experience, indicates a multitude of ways in which men have discovered God. We have no desire to convince anyone that there is only one way by which faith can be acquired. If what we have learned and felt and seen means anything at all, it means that all of us, whatever our race, creed, or color, all of us are the children of a living creator with whom we may form a relationship upon simple and understandable terms as soon as we are willing and honest enough to try. Right out of our big book. Please note that these are beliefs. They are not experiences. What Bill Wilson offers here is any belief you might want to have, just so long as that belief is in a living creator God who's available for you to form a personal relationship. I mean, the solution of Alcoholics Anonymous, as put forward in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, is you need a vital spiritual experience, but you need a vital spiritual relationship with a, with a providential God, a God that you can pray to and, and get answers from, a God that you can pray to and get help from, 
So when he talks about a personal relationship, that's what he's talking about. So any one of those beliefs in a living creator, God, that you can have a personal, helpful relationship with is okay by Bill Wilson. Please, 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 please do not misunderstand me. I am not saying that God is we understand him, and why don't you choose your own conception of God or bad ideas? I'm far, 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 far from that. I'm talking about the sources of where these ideas came from and what it actually says in the varieties and what it actually says in the big book. Those are, those are I mean, I, these are brilliant, important, and, and truly, truly revolutionary ideas. The idea that you can choose your own conception of God is so democratic, it's, 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 it's and so American, it's unbelievable. Uh, and uh, choosing your own conception of God is is uh, is equally equally brilliant, important, and revolutionary. And uh, and there are many of us who are be forever grateful for the open door that those concepts, that those words, opened up to us as we were first coming into Alcoholics Anonymous. Those ideas came from Bill's creative interpretation of what he claims to have found in the varieties of religious experience. That's where they came from, rather than from what it actually says there, because it doesn't say that there. Historians argue about how much of a reader Bill Wilson really was, and, and that question still lingers. It's a great question. We have friends that argue. I argue with it with. But Bill's implication that God as we understand him and choose your own conception of God came from varieties of religious experience very clearly proves that he was not a careful reader. He was not a careful reader if he's claiming that. This is not to say that there aren't a number of interesting ideas and varieties that Bill Wilson may well have stolen for his own purposes. I mean, there's a whole feel to the book that fits right into the We Agnostics chapter, and the, there is a solution chapter. Uh, for instance, there's 11 uses of the phrase higher power in that 527-page book. Now, over 527 pages, that's not, that's not a lot of mentions. But the fact of the matter is, Wilson does, in fact, talk about higher power in the book. He uses it as a kind of a code name for what people were having these vital spiritual experiences with. Higher powers, it was kind of a generic term. He introduced 11 times in the book. Now, we got no evidence that Bill, or, or perhaps Hank, stole that from the varieties, but but it is in fact in the book and uh, and it's really uh, it's a, it's an interesting fact that uh, Wilson claims to have read the book and uh, maybe maybe that is where he lifted it from or where Hank Parker's lifted it from. So why I have to ask are so many A's convinced that God as we understand him came directly to Bill Wilson from his reading of varieties of religious experience. There is no evidence of that book in that book to support this belief. In short, it just ain't so. It just ain't so. As I suspect that the trouble that so many A members have in reading varieties is not just the difficulty of William James's writing, it's a very, very much late 19th century writing and his ideas, but the fact that they are profoundly disappointed and profoundly frustrated because they simply cannot find what they're looking for in that book. And that, what are they looking for? They're looking for an explicit sign off from William James on God as we understand him, and why don't you choose your own conception of God? That's what they're looking for, and they're not finding it. And they're not finding it because it's just not there to find. It is not just there to find. That's not what that book is about. This is not to say that William James does not advocate for some kind of liberal attitudes towards beliefs. We're going to leave the realm of experience here and go into beliefs. Beliefs that Bill Wilson was preaching. His most explicit endorsement, endorsement James's, of the value of adopting a belief that works for you, James was all about things that worked for you. He was a pragmatist. Uh, can be found in a book that he published five years before he published Varieties. And that's a book called The Will to Believe. He published that in 1897. Now, the first essay in this book is a mere 31 pages long. And I would advise anyone interested in where AA came from to carefully study that William, what William James had to say on this topic. First essay in the book is entitled Will to Believe, and that is also the title of the book. But the, that particular essay is only 31 pages long. James's essay in that book wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly and does his, what he calls, quote, a lawfulness of a voluntarily adopted faith. You want to you adopt a faith? Is it working for you? Go for it. That's, that's lawful. No problem. It is, he says, 
quote, his long defended justification of faith, a defense of our right to adopt our right to adopt a believing attitude in religious matters in spite of the fact that our merely logical intellect may not have been coerced. Our right to adopt in spite of the fact. I mean, could there be a more accurate description of Bill Wilson's advice to choose your own conception of God as seen throughout we agnostics than that. And when you go to we agnostics, I, I believe this is this is like circumstantial evidence that Bill Wilson actually did read this chapter and understand it and pay attention to it and incorporate some of it into the book book. Here's a paragraph out of we agnostics. Um, we needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe? Will to believe willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself. As soon as a man can say that he does believe or is willing to believe, we emphatically assume, assure him that he is on his way. So the will to believe right there, stolen. If you want to, you want something where Bill Wilson's plagiarizing things from other places and putting them in the big book, I don't think there's any doubt that this came right out of that 1897 book, Will to Believe. I continue to question how closely Bill Wilson ever read the varieties of religious experience, but I do believe he made a careful study of this short essay by William James called The Will to Believe. Given how important this openness is to so many different kinds of belief uh, has been to the success of Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I will gladly concede the title of contributing founder of AA to William James. Okay, hopefully that'll be the end of my William James rants. Uh, finally, more has been revealed as I was reading as Bill sees it. Bill Wilson was always frustrated uh, by what he called the, quote, frozen state of our literature. Uh, in 1952, he wrote in response to something he got from an AA member, and he said, as to changing the steps themselves, or even the text of the AA book, I am assured by many that I could certainly be excommunicated if a word were touched. So this is prior to writing 12 and 12. <clears throat> Wilson is saying that there is, I, I mean, I'm going to get excommunicated if I just even touch the text of the AA book. He says, this is a strange fact of human nature that when a spiritually centered movement starts and finally adopts certain principles, these finally freeze absolutely solid. Can't touch them. And then in 1961, he wrote another letter on the same subject, complaining that now the 12 and 12 is out, that even the 12 and 12 is not considered to be a sacred text. And he says to this guy, as time passes, our book literature has a tendency to get more and more frozen, a tendency for conversion into something like dogma. Wilson didn't like dogma. This is a trait of human nature, which I'm afraid we can do little about. So it's just, it's just how things happen, folks. The train's coming. Get out of the way. You know, we can do little about this. Too bad. Like to change it. Can't do that. Going to get excommunicated. But six years later, just four years before he died, Bill did get a chance to change the text of the big book. At a recent meeting, we're, we're reading uh, As Bill Sees It. You know, it was a book that he, that he published in, uh, in uh, 1967. And I noticed something strange. We're reading from the book, and I'm thinking to myself, hey, it's supposed to be a quote out of the big book. That's not what it says in my big book. No, it says in my big book. And I went and got the big book. So on page five of it, as Bill sees it, there's this quote from the big book. It's a quote from the big book as follows. Uh, if we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the sudden rage were not for us. Anger is the dubious luxury of normal men. But for us alcoholics, it is poison. I was like, that's not what it says in my big book. I mean, so what happened to the brainstorm? The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us, is what it says in my book. What happened to the brainstorm? Well, brainstorm is a word whose meaning had changed radically, dramatically in the 29 years since Bill had first written. And all of a sudden, brainstorm was like people would sit down at, at, at a conference room table and they would brainstorm an idea. That was, that was what they were doing. And that's what became very accepted. But that wasn't what it was before. So he had simply substituted the words sudden rage in his attempt to clarify the original meaning of, of, of what was in the big book. He presents it in as Bill sees it as a quote from the big book, but it's not a accurate quote. 
<laughs> so did he do this kind of thing without any kind of warning whatsoever? He's changing the book and he's not telling us he's doing that? Well, no, not really. Uh, in the forward, he candidly admitted that he was giving himself permission to make changes to the text of the big book. Whoa, going to make some changes to the text of the big book that I'm going to get excommunicated for. Uh, he said, because I'm taking these quotes out of the original context, it has been necessary, he said, in the interest of clarity to edit and sometimes rewrite a number of them. Okay, Bill. Okay, so you did forewarn us. That's what it says in that little two-page forward to us, Bill sees it. You're going to have to edit and sometimes rewrite some of these in uh, the interest of clarity, he says. Looking again at that quote from page five, I realized that more than just brainstorm had been rewritten. So here, I'll, here's, here's the original with the changes. So he whacks out this when harboring such feelings and moves the harboring up. It's a, it's a cosmetic change. I'm okay with cosmetic changes. Uh, and then he puts in a then, that's cosmetic. But he also, he, he takes this entire sentence out. We found that it is fatal. Resentment is infinitely great. We found that it is fatal. Oh, and notice the fact that uh, what used to be spirit with a capital S is now small s. Uh, and then he said, if we were to live, we had to face, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the, and the sudden rage were not for us. Uh, now, they may be, but now he's like, not maybe. Anger is the dubious lecture. And to us, it is poison. So we got a bunch of cosmetic changes here. Now, so we got cosmetic changes, but not all of them are cosmetic changes. And I think these two especially are not cosmetic changes. We found that it is fatal. Um, he took the sentence out. So perhaps resentments weren't always and necessarily fatal, which is it's really what it says in the book. It says we, we can't have those resentments because they're fatal. You get yourself a resentment, it's going to be fatal for you. We found that it is fatal. Uh, but, but now he's changed that. And also the sunlight of the spirit has gone from a capital S to a small s. Uh, really interesting to me. I don't know what, what that's all about. I mean, this when I say perhaps here, we're talking speculation, but perhaps the demotion of spirit to spirit uh, would, be, would make that concept just a little bit more palatable to new people coming into the program of recovery in 1967. I don't know what he's doing there. He's toning that down. This, of course, piqued my interest, and so I looked for more changes, and I discovered that of the 74 different quotes from the big book to be found in As Bill Sees It, only 12 of them were truly accurate. And I want to thank my friends Randy Enns and uh, Jim Worley for helping me with uh, digging these things out and finding the, the differences uh, between what was in As Bill Sees It and what was originally in the big book. The other 62 were all modified to one degree or another. A lot of them People, don't get me wrong, a lot of them are just cosmetic changes, just so that he just thought it read better with, with a, a little different word here, a little bit different word there, breaking up a sentence. But but those are cosmetic changes. But not all of them were cosmetic changes. Uh, the other 62 are all modified to one degree or another by Bill Wilson in his effort to clarify and in some cases to rather freely rewrite. It's the rewrite things that really jumped out at me after the fact. Here's, here's one more example of how liberal Bill could be in his rewrite of the big book. Uh, so if we look at selection number 77, and as Bill sees it, entitled RSVP, yes or no, Bill offers this quote, which can supposedly be found on page 101 to 102 of Alcoholics Anonymous. Usually, we do not avoid a place where there is drinking if we have a legitimate reason for being there. That includes bars, nightclubs, dances, receptions, weddings, even plain ordinary parties. You will note that we make an important qualification. Therefore, ask yourself, have I any good social business or personal reason for going to this place? Or am I expecting to steal a little vicarious pleasure from the atmosphere? Then go or stay away, whichever seems better. But be sure you are on solid spiritual ground before you start and that your motive is going to be thoroughly good. Do not think of what you can get out of the occasion. Think of what you can bring to it. And if you are shaky, you had better work with another alcoholic instead. But if you look at what that I just read you was as Bill sees it version and compare it to the big book, we can clearly see the edits that he's making in this thing in 1967. So look at this. So our rule is goes to usually redo. And uh, if you have a legitimate reason for being, we've got no italics on that. Uh, he, he whacks out whoopee for whoopee parties. And then he takes out this entire sentence, which I find really interesting. To a person who has had experience with an alcoholic, this may seem like tempting providence, but it isn't. Got rid of that sentence completely. 
You will note that we make an important qualification of Vasco on each occasion is cosmetic of such places. But then again, here's, here's another whole sentence gone, gone completely. If you answer these questions satisfactorily, you need have no apprehension. Really, no apprehension. And the rest of it's kind of cosmetic. The very first edit, in my opinion, is significant. You know, demoting what has become an AA rule, a rule not to avoid places where there is drinking, that's an AA rule. Now, all of a sudden, it's a much less forceful usually. Usually, we don't tell you to avoid places where there's, that, that you don't have to avoid places where there is drinking, usually. Uh, the same kind of softening of the big book's original message can be seen in the deletion of the entire sentence about tempting providence, suggesting that perhaps Bill, suggesting, speculation. Bill felt it might be helpful for the newcomers if he toned down some, but clearly not all, of the God language in the big book. I also wonder if he worried that, uh, you know, calling it the tempting providence was, was a phrase that by 1967 people didn't really understand in the way that they understood it in the 1930s, that it was a questionable phrase for him. Although if that was just the problem, I think he would have rewritten it into something more articulate and 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 understandable to people in the, in the late 60s. Uh, but he took the entire sentence out. Similarly, the, the elimination of you need have no apprehension sentence. You need, don't worry about it. He takes the sentence out and says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. No apprehensions. Strongly implies that even under the best of circumstances, a little bit of apprehension might actually be called for. You know, if you're going in the bar all the time, you, you might want to be on your P's and Q's and paying attention. Just a little bit of apprehension is probably a good thing. And finally, by 1967, it was clearly long past time for the embarrassing and always laughable mention of whoopee parties to be deleted from the big book. Thank you, Bill Wilson. Now, while all these edicts, most especially the brainstorm, the clarification, and the whoopee deletion, should be improvements that only the most fundamentalist of A's could object to, Bill was not bashful about making even more important and substantive changes to the text of the big book. He even went so far as to edit the hallowed third step prayer, which you can find on page 63 of the original book, which a lot of people say every single morning that they get up in their life that they want to stay sober. So here's what Bill uh, did to it. A little bit of uh, cosmetic stuff there, a little cosmetic. And uh, as we understood him, by the way, is in, uh, in italics. I don't understand quite why that was. Uh, and then uh, take away my difficulties that my transcendence. Ooh. And then also we've the capital P power is now small p, small L for love, small W for way. And oh, below that, a, a, a capital S for step. We're getting rid of the, going in the other direction now. We're, we're, we're taking out lowercase and put in an uppercase, then we could at, we could commence, we could at last abandon ourselves to God. It's like, you got it, it's over and done with, but now we're commencing. So the loss of the famous italics on as we understand them, I, I find that a little perplexing. And the demotion of power, love, and way to lowercase is certainly interesting, but I wouldn't know how to speculate on that with any kind of reliable uh, certainty on my part. Uh, and I, I want you to note, too, that the capital S in step, which is which I think is a pretty damn important, which expands the meaning beyond just saying the single prayer, taking this step, saying the prayer, or taking this step, capital third step. And we're commencing to embrace the total surrender called for in the third step, commencing, as opposed to actually getting there right off the bat. But even more consequential is Bill's substitution of my transcendence for the word victory. I found this really, really, really fascinating and very insightful into Bill's subsequent journey since he wrote this book and Alcoholics Anonymous and his own spiritual growth and his spiritual life. The original holds out the promise of complete victory. It says victory over my difficulties. While my transcendence over my difficulties is something completely different, completely different. Calling for a nuanced and spiritually informed rising above. Transcendence means going above. Going above. Rather than a smash it to pieces kind of victory. Victory's like, you know, you got your, your heel on the neck of. Whereas transcendence is going above and over. It's not the same thing at all. It is not the same thing at all. It holds out a different promise. It holds out a different pathway of spiritual growth. Bill Wilson was a careful writer, and never more so than when he was writing for publication. And all these edits were 
carefully and judiciously chosen by the man who literally wrote the original text of the big book. Changes that he based on his additional 28 years of experience in dealing with alcoholics and alcoholism and his own spiritual life. If nothing else, these selections are an excellent example of the kind of flexibility and freedom that Bill Wilson most definitely felt should be brought, should be brought to the text of the big book, a freedom which treats the text as an updatable, fluid, and ever-changing document. Anyone wishing to know our founders' well-considered opinions on the kinds of changes that could and should be made to the big book need look no farther than the concrete evidence found in these 62 publicly printed changes that, in Bill Wilson's opinion, most definitely improve the contents of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. It's amazing to me that these published changes made by uh, made to AA's basic text by the founder of our movement have gone unnoticed or at least unmentioned. Nobody's ever pointed it out to me, and I've been around AA a long time. They go unnoticed and at least unmentioned in every argument to date about the possibility of producing an updated, edited version of Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> by the way, I, am, I, I don't think we should change a word of the big book. I think we need to continue to publish the big book exactly the way it was on April 10th, 1939. But, but I do think we need a new a new basic text to kind of reflect the changes in uh, in our understanding of alcoholism and the uh, our understanding of the solution and you know and and in the just massive cultural changes that have happened since 1939. So please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying throw the big book out. And we got to we got to we got to do a complete rewrite on the book. I think that book should be published like that and printed like that by Alcoholics Anonymous for the next two or three centuries, just the way it was. Doesn't mean we don't need a new kind of uh, updated version of uh, how to go about getting sober when you're a, a real alcoholic. Bill's wishes in this matter and the concrete examples that he provides and as Bill sees it have all been summarily and completely ignored. So, permit me to close with the Buddhist parable, which appears at the end of my book. The devil and a friend were walking down the street and they, they saw a man stoop down and pick something up from the ground. He, he looked at it and he put it in his pocket. The friend said to the devil, what, what did that guy pick up? Well, he picked up a piece of the truth, said the devil. Note the capital T, picked up a piece of the truth, said the devil. Well, that's a very bad business for you then, said his friend. Oh, no, no not at all. The devil replied, I'm going to let them organize it. In other words, organize it and freeze it solid. That seems to be what we've done. Thank you.